In the archives of American history, few names resonate with as much power and influence as J.P. Morgan. A titan of finance, Morgan's name conjures images of wealth, opulence, and an era when industrial magnets wielded unparalleled authority. This video is not solely dedicated to the riches amassed by one of the most prominent figures of the Gilded Age. Instead, it ventures into the intricacies of Morgan's legacy, delving deep into his pivotal role in shaping the nation's financial destiny through his involvement with the Federal Reserve. The Federal Reserve, born out of Morgan's financial prowess and economic turbulence of his era, continues to influence the lives of every American citizen. Did J.P. Morgan indeed save America with his banking acumen? Or did his actions lay the groundwork for a financial system whose merits and shortcomings continue to provoke unprecedented wealth inequality? John Pierpoint Morgan was born on April 17, 1837, in Hartford, Connecticut. He hailed from a lineage deeply entrenched in the world of business and finance. His father, Junius Spencer Morgan, held high expectations for young John and initiated his education from an early age. Following his high school graduation in 1854, John embarked on an educational journey throughout Europe. During his time abroad, he immersed himself in the study of French and German languages. In 1857, he returned to New York, where he began his career in finance. Not long after, in 1861, Morgan married a woman by the name of Amelia Sturgis, the daughter of a prosperous New York businessman. Tragedy struck four months later when Amelia succumbed to tuberculosis, marking a depressive chapter in Morgan's life. Devastated by Amelia's death, the young businessman plunged himself into his work. J.P. Morgan's journey to financial prominence began when he joined the New York banking firm of Duncan, Sherman & Company in 1857. He learned the ropes of the financial world during a crucial period in American history, as the nation was on the cusp of a civil war. During the Civil War, Morgan's father, Junius Morgan, acted as an intermediary for the British government in securing loans to fund the war effort, giving young J.P. valuable exposure to international finance. One pivotal event that catapulted Morgan into the financial elite was his role in financing the expansion of the American railway system. In the late 19th century, railroads were the backbone of the American economy, and Morgan played a key role in consolidating and reorganizing several struggling railroads. Most notably, he was instrumental in the creation of the Pennsylvania Railroad, which became the largest transportation company in the world. His ability to negotiate complex deals and provide capital for these endeavors earned him a reputation as a financial wizard. Another milestone in Morgan's career was the formation of his own firm, J.P. Morgan & Company, in 1871. The firm quickly gained a reputation for its financial stability and expertise, attracting wealthy clients and corporations seeking his financial guidance. Morgan's firm provided critical financing for the transformational merger that created General Electric in 1892, and he later played a central role in the formation of the Northern Securities Company, which aimed to consolidate control of several major railroads. The extent of J.P. Morgan's power became glaringly evident in the aftermath of the Panic of 1893. As U.S. gold reserves teetered on the brink of depletion, Morgan orchestrated a syndicate of international investors willing to supply gold in exchange for favorable terms on 30-year bonds. At the time, President Grover Cleveland was skeptical of the legality behind Morgan's actions, so Morgan unearthed an obscure 1862 statute granting the Secretary of Treasury to authorize such a deal without congressional approval. The syndicate swiftly acquired and resold the bonds in early 1895, effectively stabilizing the fragile economy. Shortly after, Morgan restructured his company and thrusted the firm into the forefront of the steel industry, as it provided the financing for the establishment of Federal Steel in 1898. Just three years later, Following the acquisition of Andrew Carnegie Steel Company for a staggering sum of nearly $500 million, Morgan orchestrated a merger that birthed U.S. Steel, marking the birth of the world's first billion-dollar corporation. Although Morgan's aspirations had gained him immense power and control, he would soon be on the radar of powerful politicians. President Theodore Roosevelt took aim at Morgan, leveraging populist demands against the wealthy Wall Street robber barons, as they were nicknamed. 
the Justice Department charged a number of Morgan's companies with violating the Sherman Antitrust Act of 1890, resulting in a protracted legal battle ultimately settled by a Supreme Court ruling in favor of the government in 1904. Nonetheless, Morgan continued to wield significant influence in both the financial and governmental spheres. In 1907, as the U.S. once again grappled with economic panic, Morgan was again called upon for assistance. Facing the collapse of several trust banks, he summoned dozens of the leading financiers in New York to his private library on Madison Avenue. As the story goes, Morgan locked them inside and ordered them to contribute to a $25 million pool that would be used to backstop the system. The plan worked, and it essentially ended the panic of 1907. But some powerful people in Washington wondered, what about the next panic? Do we really want the fate of the U.S. economy to hinge on one rich guy from New York? One individual who recognized this issue was Senator Nelson Aldrich, who chaired the Senate Finance Committee at the time. Aldrich was aware that there had to be a more systematic way to address financial crises in the United States, rather than relying on a sole individual like J.P. Morgan. He proposed the idea of establishing a central bank for the country. The concept of a central bank was not novel. European nations had already adopted such institutions. During financial crises, these central banks essentially performed the same role that J.P. Morgan did in the United States. They acted as lenders of last resort for healthy banks. When depositors were clamoring for their money, sound banks could borrow from the central bank to maintain stability. However, the idea of a central bank did not sit well with many Americans. The combinations of the words central and bank had historically been met with skepticism. The thought of wealthy bankers in New York having significant control over a powerful central bank raised concerns among the public. Nonetheless, Senator Aldrich understood that he needed the support and expertise of bankers to devise a plan for a central bank. To maintain secrecy, he organized a covert meeting. He instructed a select group of New York bankers to individually make their way to a train station in New Jersey on a specified night. There, they would find a private rail car attached to a southbound train. To maintain anonymity, Aldrich advised the bankers to dress as duck hunters and only use their first names. The train journeyed south, and the bankers disembarked in Georgia, where they spent a week in seclusion at a private club on Jekyll Island. During this time, Aldrich and the bankers collaborated to formulate a plan. Recognizing that many Americans feared the concentration of power in a central bank, they devised an American solution, a system of numerous smaller central banks scattered across the country. Although the plan faced obstacles and underwent significant modifications during its journey through Congress, the core idea endured. On December 23, 1913, President Woodrow Wilson signed the Federal Reserve Act into law. The establishment of the Federal Reserve did not immediately resolve the nation's economic challenges. In fact, in the following decades, the policies of the Federal Reserve contributed to exacerbating the Great Depression. Over the course of a century, the Federal Reserve has evolved and undergone significant changes. Nevertheless, to this day, a network of Federal Reserve banks is distributed across the country, including cities such as Dallas, Richmond, and New York. Today, the Federal Reserve enjoys an unprecedented level of popularity, often overshadowing other branches of government. Jerome Powell, its current leader, has risen to a status akin to that of a celebrity, yielding substantial influence, sometimes even surpassing that of the president. Remarkably, the Federal Reserve possesses the power to directly shape monetary policy, impacting the lives of all Americans, even though its members are not elected to public office. For the average middle-class citizen, who's getting crushed by the weight of inflation and devalued currency, the true problem stems from the unelected cadre of Federal Reserve bankers who make decisions not necessarily driven by the broader public interest, but by self-enrichment and the interests of Wall Street. The stark consequences of this arrangement have become glaringly evident over the past decade, as wealth inequality in the United States has continued to widen. Central banks worldwide have pumped trillions of dollars into the financial system, triggering alarming levels of inflation. Even more concerning, Jerome Powell, the Federal Reserve's leader, openly admitted to a lack of understanding regarding the magnitude and implications of inflation. 
when officials like these are responsible for decisions that have eroded 95% of the purchasing power since the Federal Reserve's inception, it prompts reflection on the need for a more equitable system, one that benefits all citizens rather than primarily the top 10%. So what are your thoughts on JP Morgan's role in the birth of the Federal Reserve? Do you think he foresaw the turmoil that would arise from its establishment? Please leave your thoughts in the comments below. And if you enjoyed this video, consider helping us out by liking this video and subscribing to our channel. Thanks for watching.